Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we discussed the process of ventilation, how air enters and leaves our lung. Uh, we looked at the control and regulation of breathing. Now we're going to see how actually gases are carried in the blood and how they will be exchanged by the process of diffusion. So we're looking at first gas transport um, Depend, uh, we're going to discuss oxygen and carbon dioxide. We're going to look at oxygen first. And remember, oxygen is going to load onto the blood from the lungs. So this is alveolar air. We have a very high percentage of oxygen. Oxygen will diffuse, this is an important word, across the respiratory membrane and go to the red blood cells where oxygen will attach to hemoglobin forming oxyhemoglobin. So the main way by which oxygen is carried in the blood is on hemoglobin. And if you remember, every hemoglobin molecule can carry four molecules of oxygen. Now this blood is going to leave the lungs and go to the tissues. At the level of the tissues, oxygen will separate from hemoglobin, and I'm going to use another word, dissociate from hemoglobin, and it will uh, diffuse to the tissues which need this oxygen. So this is a combined view. Oxygen is loaded uh, onto the hemoglobin from the lungs, to form oxyhemoglobin. When this blood reaches the tissues, oxygen will separate and will move to the tissues. So we call this the oxygen transport and delivery to the tissues. So there is a rate by which oxygen is delivered to the tissues. How do we know this rate? We know this from looking at the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Now this curve is looking at two parameters. First here we're looking at the partial pressure of oxygen. This is increasing until we reach partial pressure of 100 and we know this is the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs in the alveoli. In the tissues partial pressure of oxygen is going to be much lower. The, there is the number here of 40. Now, at those differing partial pressures of oxygen, what is the saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen? It's going to differ. So we're looking heat here at the percentage of oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. If you look at the alveoli, all of the hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. It's 100%. So this is expected normally. As the blood moves away from the lungs and starts to go to the tissues, some of this oxygen is going to be released to the tissues, and so the saturation will decrease. So when we look at, at the number 40, we're going to see that some of the oxygen has already been released, and hemoglobin is a little above 75% saturated with oxygen. So this is the norm and it shows us the rate by which oxygen is delivered to the tissues. Now are there going to be certain situations where there's going to be shift in this curve, whether there is quicker dissociation, quicker release of oxygen to the tissues or slower? Yes, there is this shift. So we're looking here at different shifts in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. This is the right shift over here. So the right shift, if I look at it, I'm looking at partial pressure of 100. Oxygen is, hemoglobin is 100% saturated with oxygen. When it starts to move to the tissues, we will see that there is faster delivery that there is more release, there is faster unloading of oxygen to the tissues than the norm. 
So if I look at my number 40 and I look at how much hemoglobin is still saturated with oxygen, it's somewhere around the 50, while I know the norm is a little over 75, which means there's quicker deliver of oxygen to the tissues over here. So what are situations where right shift will occur? This will occur if I have high temperature, higher level of PCO2, or lower pH. Now, if I combine those three factors, when do they occur? They occur in a muscle that has been exercising. So an exercising muscle will have increased temperature, accumulation of carbon dioxide, lower pH, and I would expect that oxygen release would be faster. So there's going to be a right shift in the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. The exact opposite is going to occur if I need less release. And this is going to be the left shift over here. I'm going to reverse those three situations where I don't need so much oxygen to be delivered to the tissue. So my curve will move and shift to the left side. There is more loading of oxygen than unloading of oxygen. And as a nice uh, clinical example over here of the left shift, this occurs in normal fetal circulation. The fetal hemoglobin has a great affinity for oxygen. And because the fetus gets all its oxygen from the mother's blood hemoglobin, fetal hemoglobin has a greater affinity to oxygen, pulls oxygen from the mother's blood, and we will see that the curve in the fetus is shifted towards the left. All right, so this explains how oxygen is carried in the blood. How about carbon dioxide? Carbon dioxide is carried in the blood in three different ways. We're going to focus on only one of them because it is the, um, the most common. So 70% of carbon dioxide is carried on the blood plasma. And remember, plasma is mainly water. So carbon dioxide will dissolve in the water of the plasma through carbonic anhydrase. It will become carbonic acid, and then this will dissociate into hydrogen and bicarbonate. So we say most of carbon dioxide, 70% of carbon dioxide is carried on the water of the plasma in the form of bicarbonate. Now I want you to remember that this is a reversible chemical equation, which means it can move this way or it can move in the reverse situation. And this will happen depending on which, where I am carrying the carbon dioxide. So we're going to first take carbon dioxide away from the tissues. So here we are. These are the tissues. We are pulling carbon dioxide away from the tissues. It will diffuse and go through the plasma of the blood and is carried on the plasma in the form of bicarbonate. Where do we want to carry this carbon dioxide? Remember, it's in the form of bicarbonate. We want to take it to the lungs to get rid of the carbon dioxide during expiration. So we're going to carry this to the lungs. Remember, bicarbonate, my equation will go into the opposite direction till we, till we come to carbon dioxide and water. Carbon dioxide will leave the plasma, will diffuse through the respiratory membrane, which is surrounding the alveoli, and diffuse into the alveolus to be removed during expiration. So most of the carbon dioxide is carried in the form of, um, uh, of bicarbonate. We see here how it is removed from the tissues to the blood. Bicarbonate reaches the uh, lung alveoli, is going to go back carbon dioxide and will diffuse 
and leave through the lungs. All right. I want to show you here a combined picture because sometimes when we study a certain concept and divide it, we don't realize that in the body everything is happening at the same time. So here we are. Um, the tissues are unloading their carbon dioxide to the blood, mainly to the plasma, and it's going to be carried in the form of bicarbonate while oxygen is carried in the form of oxyhemoglobin on the red blood cell and it will diffuse to the tissues. All right, so I've been using a word many times, diffuse, diffuse, diffuse. What is the process that will allow either oxygen or carbon dioxide to actually diffuse? It is a certain pressure we will learn about, which is called the partial pressure. So we're going to talk about pulmonary diffusion. A scientist, Mr. Dalton, explained to us the concept of partial pressure. He said, if I have a certain area that has a combination of gases, each of those gases will exert its own pressure. We call this the partial pressure. And the sum of all of those partial pressures will make the total pressure in this area. So if we're looking at the inspired air inside an alveolus over here, if I have a percentage of oxygen, it will have its own partial pressure. I have carbon dioxide, it will have its own partial pressure, water vapor, and nitrogen. This partial pressure is going to be different from the partial pressure surrounding this alveolus. And this partial pressure is going to control whether oxygen will diffuse from here to there or vice versa, depending on which partial pressure is greater. So diffusion will occur according to the difference in partial pressure. I want to explain quickly that we will be looking at diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide only, not nitrogen, because nitrogen does not dissolve and cannot diffuse outside the alveolus. So gas exchange occurs by simple diffusion from higher partial pressure to lower partial pressure. Let's remind ourselves about the circulation and what are actually the concentrations of gases in certain areas and accordingly partial pressures. So we're looking at the blood in the right side of the heart. This is deoxygenated blood. So when I look at the blood that is leaving the right side of the heart to go to the capillaries, this is deoxygenated blood. These are pulmonary arteries, very low in oxygen content, so the partial pressure of oxygen is only 40. High in carbon dioxide content, so the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 46. Please remember those numbers. This blood is going to go to the lungs, to the alveoli, and now I'm going to look inside the alveolus to see the partial pressure of those gases over there. Inspired air is very high in oxygen content, and the partial pressure of oxygen is going to be high, 100. While it's lower in carbon dioxide, the partial pressure is going to be 40. So now I'm going to look at the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide from the capillaries and the alveoli. So we're going to make this a little bigger to understand how diffusion occurs. This is the uh, pulmonary capillary. If I look at the partial pressure of oxygen, it's very low, it's only 40. If I look at the alveolus, it's 100. So oxygen will diffuse from higher pressure to lower pressure. It will leave the alveolus and diffuse to the vessel. The exact opposite for CO2, partial pressure of 45 versus 40, 
carbon dioxide will diffuse to the alveolus and will be removed during expiration. And now the blood that is leaving the lungs becomes oxygenated blood. Partial pressure of 100, oxygen 40 for CO2, and this is going to return to the left side of the heart to go to the general uh, systems. So blood returning here is now called oxygenated. These are the new partial pressures. And this blood is going to leave the left side of the heart and go to the systemic arteries to take oxygen to the tissues. So we're going to see what's happening in the tissues here. My partial pressures are different because the tissues have been metabolizing. They have used most of the oxygen and accumulated some carbon dioxide. So when I look at the partial pressures here at the tissues, PO2 is 40, PCO2 is 46, and we're going to see the gas exchange that's going to occur at the level of the tissues. We're going to magnify this a little. So this is at the level of the tissues. I have oxygenated blood, PO2 of 100. The tissues are only 40. Oxygen will diffuse to the tissues. PO2 of 40, the tissues have 45. So carbon dioxide will diffuse to the capillary. And now this is my systemic capillary. This becomes the deoxygenated blood, which has to return to the heart again. And this is a good um, view of how deoxygenated blood goes to the lung, gas exchange, oxygenated blood goes to the tissues, gas exchange. And this occurs with each um, heart uh, circulation cycle, and uh, it results in oxygenation of the tissues. Now, for this to occur, I have to have a very good pulmonary circulation. So, we are looking at the um, blood vessels entering and leaving the lungs. It's very highly branched. It has to be um, very um, well perfused for this gas exchange to occur. If there is any clinical situation where I do not have enough blood reaching the lungs, it will affect the gas exchange and the perfusion. And this is a common example that occurs. We call this pulmonary embolism. So this is a little thrombus, a little part of a blood clot that was formed in one of the lower limbs. It broke away and it's now moving up into the circulation. It's going through larger chambers, so it's going to pass through the right side of the heart, pulmonary arteries, and now when it reaches the pulmonary vasculature, it's going to lodge in a small blood vessel here and prevent uh, the vascularization of this area of the lung. If there is no blood supply, there is no gas exchange occurring over here, and we call this pulmonary embolism. And in certain uh, times, if it's huge enough, it can be a life-threatening uh, disease. Uh, this concludes our understanding of pulmonary gas exchange and diffusion. Thank you.